Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. This is a book about solutions. It's a, it's a book that uh, tries to learn from a source of ideas that have all benefited from a 3.8 billion year research and development period. And that source of ideas is, of course, the amazing array of living organisms that have, have developed over eons of time, and that, that ruthless sort of refinement process of, of evolution has, has produced some really quite remarkable uh, examples. And um, what biomimicry is, is, is really about uh, trying to learn from the way that functions are delivered in nature. This uh, fantastic beetle, this can detect a forest fire at roughly 80 kilometers away. And if you compare that with uh, a human-made fire detector, which has a range of about 8 meters, this is 10,000 times as sensitive. So the thing is, if we could, if we could learn from the way that uh, functions are delivered in nature, then there's a real chance we could develop solutions that are, are far better, far more sustainable, use much less energy, and so on. There's uh, quite a long history of, of architects looking to nature as a source of inspiration, uh, partly for original forms. And uh, if, if it's just about the sort of form, uh, then I would call that biomorphic architecture. And you know, there are some quite majestic examples of this, like Saarinen's TWA terminal and some of Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings and so on. What I focus on is, is very much biomimicry, which is specifically about the function. And uh, I think that's because we do need a, a functional revolution of sorts if we're to really make progress with the sustainability revolution. There are three really big challenges that we need to address over the coming decades. The first is, is about achieving radical increases in resource efficiency. So it's achieving the same functions, but with a fraction of the resource input. The second is shifting from a linear, wasteful, and polluting way of using resources to a closed loop model, in which all resources are kept within closed loop cycles. And then the third one, and possibly the most challenging, is the idea of shifting from a fossil fuel economy to a solar economy. So the, um, the book is divided up into chapters, um, and the first one is, is one of the biggest ones. This is about structures and, and how we can learn to make more efficient structures by looking at examples in nature. And it starts off with quite simple ones like using folds and curves to make more efficient forms. Moving on to more complex ones like this uh, very elegant bridge by Tonkin Lu, which is inspired by the dome action, the folding, and even the twisting that you find in, in shells. Again, to produce a, a very efficient structure. And then uh, there's also examples like the Eden Project, uh, which were inspired, was inspired by uh, soap bubbles and pollen grains and radiolaria. And one of the things that the team managed to achieve with that was a, a factor 100 saving. In the design of that envelope, uh, they managed to produce a solution that used 1% uh, uh, of the embodied energy of a traditional glass solution. And uh, Amory Lovins of the Rocky Mountain Institute, he's, he's uh, very vocal in his support for biomimicry. And he says that if we're really to make progress, we, we can't just look at making small-scale improvements. We, we need to rethink challenges from the first principles and use biomimicry to achieve factor 10 or even factor 100 savings. And um, one of the great things about nature is that materials are, are used incredibly sparingly. So uh, nature has evolved quite complex solutions that use really uh, limited amounts of materials. This is a, a section through a bird skull showing these incredibly efficient structures which combine dome technology and space frame technology. And you know, in some ways, these ideas aren't particularly new. Um, architects have been looking at shells for centuries. But I think the key difference now is that we have much better scientific knowledge and much better design tools. So in the case of the abalone shell, now we can um, understand the actual microstructure, which allows it to achieve such an efficiency of form. At a chemical level, it's pretty much the same material as blackboard chalk, but uh, through this hierarchical structure and interfaces, it achieves 3,000 times the toughness. And that, that leads into the next chapter, which is about uh, materials. How will we manufacture materials? And uh, this is, is an image of a, a spider spinneret, a series of spider spinneret glands. It's a magnified view of the abdomen of a spider. And uh, what the spider does is it produces about six different types of silk, which it then spins together into a fiber tougher than any fiber humans have ever made. And the nearest we've come is with aramid fiber. And if you compare the way these are made, to make aramid fiber, 
you have to take petroleum and then you boil it in sulfuric acid at about 750 degrees C. And then following the principle that if brute force doesn't work, where well, you clearly haven't used enough, you pile on extremes of pressure to get the molecules into place. Out of that, you get your fiber uh, and a huge amount of pollution. So extremes of temperature, extremes of energy and, and uh, pressure, uh, and loads of pollution, and all that to do the same as a spider does at room temperature with raw materials of dead flies and water. And uh, you know, that does suggest we've still got quite a bit to learn. One of the most exciting developments is in uh, computer software uh, that allows uh, rapid prototyping or rapid manufacturing. So that's a process by which you can turn a three-dimensional computer model into a physical model. And what's great about that is that it allows you to achieve a complexity of form with a minimum of materials without additional cost. And there's even a chance that we could start to use natural polymers. If we could learn to do 3D printing using polymers like cellulose and chitin, then we really would be making radical increases in resource efficiency. And if we could make a factor 10 saving in the amount of energy used in materials, and then multiply that by a factor 10 saving in the efficiency of the structure, then factor 100 savings would, would become commonplace. There's a huge amount of inspiration here to be drawn from the way that ecosystems work. Our systems tend to be simple, disconnected, and monofunctional. In nature, systems are complex, interconnected, and symbiotic. Ours are wasteful. In nature, they're zero waste, and so on. And I don't propose to go through all of these, but I think if we look down that uh, right-hand list, that's a pretty good summary of, of what we need to be trying to achieve with the way we make things, the way we run our cities and, and industries, and, and so on. And uh, there are one or two uh, projects that have attempted to mimic uh, ecosystems. And one of my favorites is the Cardboard to Caviar project set up by a guy called Graham Wiles in Kirklees and Calderdale. And what they did here is that they collected cardboard waste from shops and restaurants. They then shredded it and sold it to equestrian centers as horse bedding. Then when that was soiled, it, they were paid to collect it. They put it into wormery composting systems which produced lots of worms, which they fed to Siberian sturgeon, which produced caviar, which they sold back to the <laughs> restaurants. And um, that, I mean, that was just the sort of summary. And actually, the, the guy who set this up, Graham Wiles, he's continued to add more and more things to this, uh, using uh, sewage sludge from the adjacent waterworks to uh, rehabilitate loads of industrial land to grow uh, willow biomass, growing uh, fruit and vegetables, which uh, could be sold back to the, the restaurants using plants to treat the water system to take the nutrients out of this, uh, and adding more and more waste streams along the way. And um, the other thing that he's been very inventive with is not just physical forms of waste, but um, underutilized human resources. And uh, you could argue that there's no more deplorable form of waste than underutilized human resources. So here, the cardboard shredding was done by uh, people with disabilities. The fish farm was operated by reforming heron addicts and they've achieved phenomenal uh, success with getting the addicts off drugs and back into uh, society, whereas the local authority was spending sometimes as much as £100,000 per addict uh, and ha having a 95% failure rate. And just as ecosystems uh, tend to increase in diversity and resilience over time, there's a real sense in which the more this system grows, the, 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 more, the, number of, the, the more the possibilities increase. You know, coming back to those three big challenges, um, of radical increases in resource efficiency, linear to closed loop, and uh, a solar economy. You know, some people might scoff at the idea of uh, factor 100 savings or operating in zero waste ways, but the, you know, the, the natural world is living proof of the possibility of this. And within nature, we can find a whole array of solutions to, to many of the challenges we face, even quite sp specific ones like fire safety and, and so on. And I think biomimicry could be seen as the logical conclusion of a shift that has gone from trying to dominate nature to then trying to preserve parts of nature and now trying to reach a reconciliation with nature in which we retain the many wonderful things that civilization has developed, like modern medicine and so on, but we use biomimicry to rethink the things that have proved to be poorly adap adapted to the long term. I know you expressed frustration as an architect and things moving too slowly and perhaps the current system's not facilitating the type of progressive work that you'd like to do. Yeah. And I wonder if we could first start in the UK context okay. and hear a little bit of your uh, wish list, I suppose. I understand that I think only about 20% of the audience are architects and a lot of other people are drawn from broader policy or industry background. So what, how you'd like to see that context shift to facilitate um, more efficient efficient resource efficiency and perhaps productivity um, 
through biomimetic design. You know, some people would reach for legislation here, but I, I actually think it, it would be fiscal instruments that could really make a difference here. And I'll give you one example. Um, there are some countries in the world that are already running short of water, and because it's become a real problem, uh, uh, the government has responded by making water effectively free, um, which is a short-term fix, but the longer-term implications of that is that there's then very little incentive to invest in technologies that use water much more sparingly. I think it would be better to mimic the kind of conditions that uh, nature has created um, by making resources actually more expensive, by taxing resources, and then investing that tax into uh, helping, say in this case, farmers uh, install more water-efficient um, systems. And you know, rather than trying to uh, legislate for a low-carbon economy, if, if we were to just uh, apply taxation to, to fossil fuels at, at, the, uh, at source, then that would actually stimulate, stimulate a lot of the kind of innovative thinking that uh, biomimicry offers that allows you to achieve really, really substantial savings in resources, uh, sometimes at slightly extra cost. Uh, but because fossil fuels don't really take any uh, account of the, the kind of damage costs of, of carbon dioxide pollution and so on, the finances at the moment are skewed, and, mm -hmm. and the more uh, innovative solutions uh, don't kind of uh, come to fruition. At the end of the book, you exhort students and practitioners to collaborate interdisciplinarily. And um, you yourself seem to have a tremendous amount of access to these detailed, cutting edge scientific resources. In my experience of an average architectural practice or classroom, that's really not the case. And wonder if you had any suggestions of how policy or institutions might help bring <laughs> the dis discipline of the designer and the discipline of the scientific researcher into closer contact with each other? Perhaps um, having a greater degree of uh, interaction at university mm -hmm. rather than having the sort of silos of departments. I think architects really need to, and other designers, uh, need to uh, learn a bit more about other disciplines because in order to collaborate, you need to understand the sort of essence of, of the other discipline. You don't need to be a qualified biologist, but you need to... Uh, be able to ask the right questions mm -hmm. and so on. And I think there's also uh, an issue there about having the collaboration at the right point. In uh, building projects, often ecologists are brought in uh, at a late stage to do the body count, essentially, once the design has been done. And there is potential for a, a much more productive interaction if, if you get the ecologists and the biologists at the design table uh, right at the beginning.